The international community has been watching in shock as the Taliban has rapidly captured Afghanistan in recent weeks. Pictures and videos of the chaos in Kabul airport have been circulating throughout the world. Moreover, as of Monday, August 23rd, Canada has taken in 1,100 people from Afghanistan and the United States has taken in 17,000. Amidst the constantly evolving situation, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will convene a meeting with G7 leaders to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. At this meeting, it is expected that possible sanctions against the Taliban will be tabled. Joining us to discuss this further is Cameron Bakari, the Director of Analytical Development at New Line's Institute for Strategy and Policy in Washington and National Security Foreign Policy Specialist at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute. Thank you for joining us again today, Kamran. Thank you for having me again. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan is evolving so rapidly. Do you have any updates to your reaction from last week? Well, it's pretty much panning out the way I uh, you know, expected it to. Um, the Taliban have a long way to go before uh, they can form a new government. Uh, there's also the evacuation that's underway that the Taliban want to end before they uh, move towards announcing or uh, a new regime and what it would look like. But even if they announce it, I mean, it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a work in progress. There's a, there are a lot of challenges as I've been sort of tweeting about it. Uh, you know, this is a force that uh, is an insurgent force. Uh, it hasn't governed in 20 years, and uh, the people who governed for the Taliban uh, are far fewer than the ones who are now part of the movement. Yeah. Uh, and, and even when they governed or ruled the country. It was a very rudimentary form of governance. Uh, you know, they didn't really build institutions uh, or, or, you know, whether it's security or administrative, there wasn't really a political economy. Uh, only three countries recognized it, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Yeah. Uh, and that was a different Afghanistan. It, uh, this is a very, very different Afghanistan. In fact, I was just on TRT, the Turkish state broadcaster, and uh, to do another interview. And they were running a clip from one of their correspondents and they showed, you know, young boys, there were about like a half a dozen of them, a rollerblading th through the streets of Kabul. Uh, and uh, I mean, obviously these people were probably from, uh, you know, a, uh, the middle class, if you will, to the extent that there is one in that country. Mm -hmm. While the Taliban, you know, uh, vehicles with their militiamen are running around, it's a really complicated uh, country for the Taliban to to. Uh, to it's one thing to, for them to take over militarily; it's going to be hard for them to govern this place. Building off of that, U.S. President Joe Biden has said that extending the withdrawal of troops past the August 31st deadline is not out of the question. However, the Taliban has said that extending the occupation in the region is a red line and that there will be consequences if the U.S. does this. What are your thoughts on this? And in your opinion, what could be some of the consequences that the Taliban are alluding to? So, look, I mean... This is all posturing from the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, so be, actually, before I get to the Taliban, uh, I think that it needs to be unpacked as to why uh, the US uh, is, uh, is, is seeking more time or, uh, or says that it can't be done by August 31st. It's just the sheer scale of uh, the evacuation. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's, they're not going to be able to pull all the people out that they want to. Uh, or the numbers that they have in mind, which I don't know what that number is. Uh, but it's reasonable to say that even the ones that they do want to make sure that they get out, uh, this can't be accomplished by that deadline. So that's so that's the just it's a sheer logistical issue. I don't think the United States has you know any other um, motivation here. Uh, the U.S. is done with this place. Uh, and it, it's, it's not an attempt to continue the occupation as the Taliban propaganda is trying to describe it. But uh, 
I mean, that's that's where we are right now. And we still have what, you know, today is the 23rd. We have another eight or, you know, seven to eight more days to go uh, before uh, that August 31st deadline rolls in. So we'll see, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, but I think that the, the Biden administration is sort of uh, saying this so that it's kind of like a heads up. Hey, you know, we won't be done. So uh, we're letting you know in advance. Now, as far as the Taliban are concerned, look, this is, this is rhetoric. Uh, they just, uh, they're just trying to appear as though they are in charge and they're speaking from the point of view of a government, not a group. Mm -hmm. And this buys them a lot of credibility among, uh, within their target audience. Uh, and uh, they need to keep the pressure as well uh, because, um, They've been waging a 20-year insurgency, and the the moment that they've been waiting for, which is a complete sort of end of any American military presence in the country, uh, is at hand, and they want to get there as fast as possible. But the idea of threatening and, you know, there'll be consequences, I find them more hollow words than anything else, because there's not much the Taliban can do, uh, because they do not want to be seen as uh you know version 1.0 of their emirate uh and uh they want to be they, they need international recognition they want to be seen as a responsible actor they want money above all from the uh, the uh, international community and they know that the united states is the one that can actually uh either you know provide for that or deny it and 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 so they can't follow through with these uh, threats, but it's it makes for good public relations from their point of view. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's where we are. I wouldn't put too much stock in statements to the press. I mean, no actor ever tells you what they're really gonna do ahead of time and definitely not in front of the media. Yeah, and neither side is really saying, like the US is alluding to the fact that it's not done, but they're not saying what they're going to be doing and vice versa. I found it interesting that you said that the Taliban won't really act on their threats. Do you think that that's just while there's another country's presence within Afghanistan? Or do you think that they will continue to uphold their at least facade of, of peace? Yeah, I, what I meant by that is that they're threatening consequences to the U.S. Yes. And I'm saying there's no way you're going to do that and then expect to get financial assistance. OK, yeah, so there's just no way that's happening. Yeah. Uh, and already the the recognition is incoming. The U.S. will drag its feet uh, on, uh, you know, that financial assistance because it wants to see and wait and see, uh, you know, just how much the Taliban are willing to behave. And this is the leverage that the United States it has. And it's not going to give it up so easily. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a complete mistrust. So yes, they signed a piece of paper uh, that uh, basically said, "Hey, we're not going to harbor, uh, you know, Al Qaeda and other transnational, uh, you know, extremist groups, and we won't uh, allow Afghanistan to become a launch pad for attacks against any other country." I mean, those are words. That's a signature mm -hmm. uh, and a handshake. But do you really trust them? And I don't think yeah. that anybody would trust them. And so th th this has to be seen. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and it's just, it's some sort of accountability and whether they can uphold that or not after they pull out, the U.S. can uphold that or not uh, after they pull out. It remains to be seen, I suppose. Well, I think that, look, uh, right now everything is fresh. They mm -hmm. want to put, you know, their best face forward. Uh, and... Uh, they're doing all this info ops, psychological ops, PR campaign, yes. call it whatever, uh, and they will. This will slowly taper off. At the end of the day, uh, the the Taliban have shown or demonstrated that they can be pragmatic. Uh, they can say the things that the the, the world wants to hear. Yes. Uh, but when it comes to actual behavioral change. Uh, and much less ideological change. That's not happening. They're not moderating, to use that term, uh, their behavior. Uh, they're still the same old. Uh, you know, if you are a, a group that has is a jihadist group that's mm -hmm. been engaged in suicide bombings, 
and believes in Al-Qaeda ideology and ISIS ideology, even though you may not share the global caliphate, uh, you know, objective of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and you're sticking to your country, that doesn't mean you're different. That means you're the same. It's just that you've committed yourselves to a particular geography. You're going to do the same thing in your geography, which is the country of Afghanistan. Uh, and you can't change who you are. So sooner or later, we're going to see the, the mask come off. And it won't happen all of a sudden. It's going to happen gradually. Uh, well, and this, this is the challenge for the Taliban leadership is to, you know, for the leadership, how do they make sure that what they're saying on camera uh, is being abided by by their foot soldiers who are essentially, uh, you know, militiamen high on ideology mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, thuggish in behavior. Yes. In your opinion, should the U.S. extend the withdrawal of its troops past the August 31st deadline? Look, at the end of the day, uh, if the United States needs more time uh, and there's no one that can say no, mm-hmm. the Taliban can threaten, the Taliban can, uh, what are, let's, let's examine what the Taliban can potentially do. Uh, so let's say there are thousands of troops there, mm-hmm. so those can come under harm's way. Uh, and that's probably what the Taliban are alluding to, that there will be consequences. Um, but, you know, um, are they really going to follow through with that and risk uh, being, you know, caught and, and left to fend for, you know, tens of millions of people uh, in, and without any resources? So they, I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're bluffing. Uh, and let's say, let's assume they're not. What is the worst that they can do? Is they gonna, they're going to create logistical problems? carry out attacks Mm -hmm. uh, uh, against uh, U.S. forces. Uh, Again, uh, do they want to do that and risk lose international funding and recognition that they are so badly in need of, and which is why they're putting up this, uh, you know, dog and pony show for Mm -hmm. the rest of the world and going in front of cameras and trying to behave like they are some form of statesman? No, I, I, I have a hard time believing that they will actually do that. Though the Taliban spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid has stated that nobody will be harmed in Afghanistan, recently the brother to an Afghan translator has been sentenced to death for helping the Americans and providing security to the accused's brother, who has been an interpreter. This case is just one of many similar cases which has recently been reported. Why do you think that the Taliban is saying that they want to be peaceful and that their rule will be different to that of 20 years prior if their actions are not indicating that they will be? So, yeah, so this is what I was trying to explain that on one hand, they're trying to put like a a soft image of themselves and they're speaking in a language that seems uh, conciliatory, uh, but they can't control their behavior. Uh, and what they can do, potentially, is to limit the number of these excesses in certain areas. Uh, but you and mean so, by like limiting media or limiting like the, the eyes on them? Well, limiting to the extent that they go after people until, okay. until they are more firmly in place. Um, and so the orders that I suspect that have been given from the top you know, it are as follows. Uh, hey, you know, uh, all, act only when you see something extremely egregious that just can't be tolerated uh, based on whatever criteria that is. Yes. And so what they're basically saying to their fighters, uh, just hold your horses and uh, we don't want this to hurt us. And um, but yes, there could be a situation where someone who they deem as an enemy that is irreconcilable needs to be eliminated uh, or represents a threat that needs to be eliminated. And so so the rule is don't go after people just yet, but we understand that there will be exceptions and that judgment is left to you know the people on the street, whoever is responsible for uh, this, the, the, the security or uh, you know, monitoring a certain area. 
Now think of how many areas there are and think of how many uh, you know, commanders and fighters have been given that discretion. And then you know, those numbers can add up very quickly. Yes. So that's what I think is happening is that they, they're just sort of delaying uh, what they uh, have been trying to do, uh, what the, the delaying what they uh, would do under, you know, if all things being equal, they if, had, had this been the 90s. So they're, it's not like they don't want to go after people. It's like they they still want to be able to go after people because they see them as threats, but they're constrained because of this need for international recognition and financial assistance. So it's like kicking the can down the road. Uh, and then, of course, they also want to minimize the number of people who are going to actively oppose them. Now, how do you do that? You do that by playing nice, by telling the population, look, you know, we came and the West was telling you and our enemies were telling you that everything would, you know, uh, this uh, would, uh, you know, go to hell and and your lives would be miserable. Nothing of that has happened. We didn't, you know, there's no, uh, the, we're not uh, attacking people. We actually took over in a negotiated way and we're not really going, uh, we're actually talking to our enemies. So they're doing a perception shaping here, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, uh, it's one thing to sort of hold off on this. I think of these as, you know, those temporary ceasefires over the years that mm -hmm. they've done on the religious holiday of Eid. So three day ceasefire, nobody's fighting. In fact, you, there were reports that of Taliban militiamen and Afghan security forces, uh, you know, celebrating together, sending each other, you know, sweets and whatnot only to go back and kill each other uh, three days later once the holiday was over. Yeah. So this is their past behavior. I have a hard time believing that that kind of mindset uh, is going to change anytime soon. You can limit, but ultimately they are who they are. Yeah, so would you say that part of the answer would be to keep eyes on them and pressure and to keep engaging them so that they understand that the leverage that the international community has on them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This, is the, this is the way to make sure, because look, uh, they're the government, they're gonna form a state, uh, and we just need to be able to hold their feet to the fire mm -hmm. and make sure that, uh, you know, we can't, we can't force them, we don't have the capability to force them to, uh, you know, impose laws that are not authoritarian draconian mm -hmm. that's not something we can do but what we can do is to sort of uh you know place constraints in their path and then use that as a mechanism to make them you know recalculate and say is it worth doing these draconian laws if we're going to lose money uh and so what good is ideology and then over time you know uh this is how and this is going to be a long-term process if mm -hmm. it succeeds. I'm not sure it can, uh, but over time, this is the way to effect behavioral and then, you know, hopefully ideological change, even if it is very, very little. Uh, so they, you can't change who they are, but maybe you can change how they behave, uh, exactly. and be because there are there are carrots and and sticks that are in play. The Taliban senior commander Wahidullah Hashimi has said that Afghanistan will be governed based on Sharia law and that a panel of Islamic scholars will decide what the illegal system will look like rather than democracy. Do you think that the Taliban can implement a form of government based on Sharia law that respects the human rights of all Afghan nationals? So here's the problem. So there's something called the ideology Mm -hmm. which is what the Taliban are uh, indulging in, because that's who they are. They're an ideological movement. Mm -hmm. And there's something called governance and public policy. So the, the problem that they face, and which every ideological uh, group faces, I mean, uh, even back in during the Cold War, uh, Marxists and communist uh, regimes, uh, you know, faced this problem. And, and, and so the Soviet Union itself faces the problem, is how do you uh, 
maintain, you know, the ideological purity mm -hmm. and yet come up with policies that will work, you know, uh, in terms of delivering a political economy. Mm -hmm. So that's where the Taliban are right now. Uh, they, this is all for, you know, uh, even look, the one thing that, you know, clever ideological actors uh, don't do is that, and this is at a high level, this is at the letter level of the leadership, mm -hmm. that they don't drink their own Kool-Aid. So they're saying one thing to the world, but deep down they know that this isn't going to be enough to govern, you know, because once you're in power, how will you govern? Exactly. What does Sharia law mean? You know, does it mean you're just going to impose uh, medieval, uh, if you will, dress codes on people, medieval laws governing the interaction of the genders? Uh, are you going to impose draconian medieval uh, understandings of, of, of uh, you know, what punishments uh, should be? Uh, mm. I mean, okay. So you do that, but that's not governance. That's not public policy. What is your policy to uh, when it comes to educating people? If you don't educate people, you won't have an economy. Exactly. You won't have, you, won't, you don't teach science. And if you place restrictions on freedom of thought, uh, then you end up, you know, with a cesspool. Uh, you, you don't have, uh, there aren't people qualified to run a government. So how do you do that? How you know, so if you and if you look at, you know, for example, uh, Iran next door, uh, one of the things that they uh, have done, uh, and 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 they are struggling with it even after 40 years, is how do you maintain the ideological identity of the state, the regime, and then actually make it work for the people? Uh, and there are 80, 90 million people in Iran, mm -hmm. far less in Afghanistan. But you get my point as to, you know, can you feed them on the idea that uh, we're going to impose Sharia law? How how does that answer questions? And what does that mean for creating jobs? What does that mean for, uh, you know, uh, just providing services? Mm -hmm. gonna, how will you pick up garbage? What does Sharia law have to do with picking up garbage? Right. Uh, you know, just the basics you know, municipal service, which is like sanitation. Yeah. Uh, how will you provide for water? Uh, and, and how will you provide for electricity? Uh, and how will people be able to uh, make a livelihood? How will people be able to trade and go to work? What will happen there? See, it's one thing to say that, oh, we're going to impose Sharia law. And in my view, that's kind of like a placeholder. Uh, uh, you know, argument mm -hmm. until they figure out how to do that. So, you know, they don't know what they're going to be doing, you know, six months from now. Right now, everything is fresh. They've, I don't know if I've said this in your show before, but I think I have in, you know, on, in other media interviews that they, you know, suffered what they call catastrophic success. And they've never planned for the day after because the day after was not, from their point of view, or they weren't expecting it to come so quickly. Yeah. And so now they're not prepared to govern. Now they're having to think about things that they could afford to put off mm -hmm. because they were in a different situation. And now uh, that they, you know, they, you know, if you if you uh, if you're militarily victorious, that's just the beginning. You know, that's where sort of you know, yes, you can go into party mode. And mm -hmm. you can go into sort of celebration mode and the euphoria is there, but it's very short lived because if you are a group that takes over power, then there's the saying you need to get to work. And that work is actually dealing with, you know, uh, a country's needs and its people's needs. Sharia law isn't going to do that for you, whatever you think Sharia law is. And that's a different sort of conversation to have. but. Uh, yeah. The bottom line is, these are slogans, they're not policies. Today there are many Muslim majority countries who base their laws on the Sharia. Despite their same ideological underpinnings, why is there such variation in the type of laws we see? How do you think that this inconsistency will play out in Afghan context? 
Because there's no one thing called Sharia. Sharia is what uh, isn't what God said in the Quran or what the Prophet uh, reportedly said, uh, mm-hmm. documented in the Hadith. Uh, Sharia is when human beings go into these texts, understand them in a certain way, and then operationalize them. So there are can there are as many sh- you know Shariatic interpretations out there mm-hmm. as there are human beings. You know, they could be potentially not. Well, not everybody becomes, you know, a, a Sharia scholar uh, or has the you know expertise to to do that interpretation. But the point that I'm making is the reason why you have so many sects in any religion, and the same applies for Islam, is that you know there isn't one thing called the Sharia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it it you know, and and this is a a, a much nuanced concept and debate over which volumes have been written since, you know, the uh, the beginning of Islam, uh, since Muslim scholars started to think about these things and, and then expound on them. And, you know, there there's just no one thing. This is, this is the problem of Islamists and, and the modern ideology of Islamism, is they have an imagined view of what was the past and they, uh, you know, uh, have this warped view of Sharia as being something specific. So, uh, you know, if you go through the motions of having a conversation with an Islamist, uh, the conversation goes as follows. So, okay, so what do you want? Uh, well, we want an Islamic state. Well, what is that? How Don't you think that these Muslim majority countries are Islamic states? No, because they don't imp- implement the Sharia. Okay, what does that mean? What is your conception of Sharia? And then they will invariably tell you that uh, uh, you know that it's the you know in implementation of certain laws. But that's the end of the conversation. After that, you have so many different models of what Sharia looks like. I mean, just look at the number of Islamist movements mm-hmm. that have tried their hand on this. You go from you know the Islamic Republic of Iran to Hezbollah in a multi-confessional society of Lebanon, to Hamas, to Al-Qaeda, to ISIS, to the Taliban, to the Muslim Brotherhood, and its various manifestations across different geographies. They're all very, very different. There is no common ground because it can't be a common ground. So this is why I say this is a slogan more than it is something very definitive. Great thoughts. I'm. I love your assessment on on all of these topics that we've discussed so far. Uh, Since their first time capturing Afghanistan in the 1990s, a lot has changed in the world, um, as you were mentioning before, particularly with globalization. In your opinion, with the Taliban's desire to avoid isolation from the international community to be a sufficient check on ensuing, ensuring that the brutality of their earlier rule is not repeated? Yeah, and this is goes back to the leverage that we talked about earlier, uh, where uh, they will need money, uh, and you know, the the money that they need can only be given to them by the West, yeah. uh, because the Chinese don't give uh, grants or loans. Their their model of doing business with the rest of the world is very different. Mm-hmm. Russia doesn't have any cash to get. So, and, and the Japanese are part of the Western, you know, alliance. Mm-hmm. And then there's, you know, countries like, you know, Turkey, Brazil, India, the you know, second tier powers, uh, and they don't have the kind of cash either. So they need to be able, to, so that gives a lot of leverage to the West. Now, where things can go wrong, uh, or where the Taliban can try to cut corners, is to uh, basically do business with the Chinese, give the Chinese what they want, and in exchange uh, get, you know, some form of financial assistance that helps them get by temporarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because here's the problem. The West uh, and the broader international community wants, uh, you know, to see a certain uh, amount of freedom that Afghans can enjoy and, and they can be, you know, they, they, they have a right to freedom. 
-hmm. The problem with the Taliban is not just that their ideology is anti-freedom, is they don't know how to operate by giving freedom. If they give freedom, they end up, you know, uh, imploding, if you will. They can't maintain power by giving freedom. That's not who they are. Mm -hmm. So what are they going to do? This is where the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians and, and even Pakistan will help them to uh, main, you know, with with basically population control measures, mm -hmm. uh, giving the veneer of that people are free, you know, having that sort of, uh, if you will, show and tell. Uh, but in reality, you use technology, uh, you use other forms of coercion. Uh, security forces and intelligence apparatuses uh, to make sure that dissent is in control. So freedom is a problem. You can, I mean, if freedom didn't threaten the Taliban uh, uh, regime or such regimes, whether they're you know in Iran or Russia or China, then uh, you know maybe they would give freedom to their people. But they are there's there's a reason why. Uh, authoritarianism is 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 based on uh, you know suppression of freedoms because it's it, it, it does not function that's why it's uh, uh, qualitatively very different from democracy mm -hmm. so and and that's the that's the whole struggle that is the struggle of you know president putin in russia president xi uh in in china and every other autocratic regime that's out there and the Taliban are soon going to be another autocratic regime if they're not already. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they're not a regime yet, but they they are they're headed there, that way. So they there's an, the Chinese from from their point of view, uh, they would you know they're taking comfort from the fact that uh, you know they're another state in the region uh, has fallen under the grip of autocracy because. The more there is the spread of democracy, uh, then that undermines Chinese interests. Yes. Well, as you're aware, the G7 is set to meet on Tuesday, August 24th, in light of the recent situation in Afghanistan. Uh, reportedly, the world leaders will consider implementing sanctions on the Taliban. In your opinion, should the G7 sanction the Taliban? If so, what kinds of sanctions should be put in place? Well, look, I mean, they're already sanctioned. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the Taliban are still uh, under the terrorist label. Mm -hmm. uh, the UN has to withdraw that uh, if they're going to recognize, if the international community is going to recognize, assuming the Taliban behave, and there is trust that is developed, and that's not going to happen anytime soon. So they're, in many ways, they're already a, a, a pariah that is, you're, why are they seeking recognition? Mm -hmm. Because in many ways they're already, uh, you know, an embargoed entity, if you will. Now, yes, can there be more sanctions? Yes. But the problem here is that uh, this is a difficult balancing act. You want to sanction the regime, but once you sanction regimes, and history has told us, you know, uh, over and over again, that uh, what happens is that these regimes don't collapse uh, or don't change the way we want them to change, but the people suffer. So there's going to be mass suffering if you uh, impose sanctions. And so there's a trade-off. I think there needs to be, you know, careful thought as to, on one hand, and, and you know, I, I, I don't envy the position of those in the G7 countries who are going to be making these decisions, yeah. because it's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to, uh, you know, hold the regime accountable and your tool, one of your tools is sanctions. Mm -hmm. But that tool has unintended consequences, which is that it hurt, hurts the people. Because if a sanctioned regime uh, will have the lives of people living under a sanctioned regime are miserable. We're seeing that, you know, in Iran. And the idea is that maybe the people will rise up. And, and then topple this regime uh, uh, or force it to behave differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've not seen that succeed in a lot of other places. Look, Cuba held out. Communist Cuba held out for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Iran has held out for 40 years. 
and, and Russia is holding out, even though it, it, it also has sanctions from the West, especially after the takeover of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, or sorry, the, the, the war in Ukraine, where the, the Russians are supporting uh, pro-Russian rebels in the east of that country. So mm-hmm. the point that I'm trying to make is uh, this is something that the international community will have to think hard, and there are going to be difficult choices that need to be made. So what do you think will be on the agenda, and what kind of choices will they need to make? I think on the agenda, there will be this immediate things. Um, Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with Afghanistan? That is Emirate Mm -hmm. 2.0. How do we make sure that uh, Afghanistan, that the Taliban actually don't go back to the 90s? Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I mean, I, I, I guess that's sort of like a whole lot for the agenda. You can't ask for more because these items in, unto, uh, in of themselves are uh, going to have, uh, they're going to keep uh, the G7 countries and, and the broader international community very, very busy for quite some time to come. Yes. And uh, just more on a personal note and for the viewers at home, because we've all been sitting and in the West, at least we've been sitting and watching this situation unfold and evolve so rapidly and now we're starting to digest and process that this is the way it's probably going to be for a while. Do you have any advice or suggestions for what we can do to help Afghans? I think that, you know, I assume by we, you mean, you know, journalists and analysts and people who are watching this. Yeah, so, viewers at home. So I think us. that it's important that people, uh, uh, you know, try their best to understand this complexity because it's very easy to, uh, you know, get carried away with information that's not necessarily true mm-hmm. uh, or even partial. So the more better, we, you know, public understanding is of, uh, you know, Afghanistan, and this, this doesn't go for Afghanistan for any issue, mm-hmm. and, and the less you look at it through ideological and partisan and political lenses, uh, the more rigorous the public understanding is of, of the issue, the better, you know, the conversation will be that that will then feed into the policy making uh, process uh, for each country, whether it's Canada and, or the United States, or even if it's a, even at the multilateral level. Uh, at the end of the day, policy making isn't something that just policy makers uh, do in government. Even those who uh, are uh, policy analysts like myself in the think tank space or in the world of journalism, mm-hmm. uh, it's a it, it's based on a collective sort of public conversation. So the better our and rigorous and nuanced and sophisticated our conversation is, the better decision makers and policy makers uh, will be able to craft uh, the responses that are needed. Thank you so much for answering that question um, and for joining us again for this interview. I really appreciate your your assessment of the situation and continued efforts to inform us all about it. Thank you, Kamran. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in to today's episode of News Talk with Ava Blackwell. Remember to subscribe, like, and turn on bell notifications so that you don't miss any of our latest content.